Hi, everybody, wherever you are. It's a horrible wet evening here in Blackheath. It's been raining all day, so I'm glad you don't have to go to the Blackheath uh, old bakery uh, because you'd probably decide it's much better to stay at home and not bother. So um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, turn off your, you've mostly turned off your cameras. That's good. Um, and I'm going to be talking for about an hour uh, about the birthplace of the international telecoms industry and in effect the internet uh, and I mean not just London in general but here in southeast London in particular because I'm in Blackheath. Uh, this is the uh, first virtual meeting of the Greenwich Industrial History Society as you see on the screen and what we're going to be doing is talking about why this part of London from Greenwich, Down River to Woolwich and Erith, although I'm not going to cover Erith because it's too far away, um, <laughs> from Greenwich right down to Erith has been where the international telecoms industry started. Um, right, so there is where we are. And if you look at that map, you'll see the Millennium Dome, a sort of north west of the map at the end of the Greenwich Peninsula. That's the bit that Mary Mills, who's our co-chair, used to be councillor for on the borough of Greenwich. And a bit down from there is Enderby House, where it all started. If you head eastwards beyond the... Uh, there we are, that's much easier. Be be beyond the barrier, you'll see a whole lot of blobs that blob on the east, to the east of the barrier, the southeast of the barrier is Siemens Brothers. If you go to the north of the river, you've got uh, STC and you've got Henley and you've got, oh goodness, I can't remember the other one. Anyway, and the green dot is uh, Woolwich Poly, which surprisingly plays an absolutely huge role in the development of telecoms. The, Two red dots on the western side are um, Enderby House and um, oh, Warden Wolf. Well, thank you, Warden Wolf. Yes, sorry, my brain went. So the orange one is where the Great Eastern was launched. So all of that stretch across that picture is where the international telecoms industry started. Uh, and there, as I say, there were more off, uh, more down river off to the east in Erith. Um, and the green spot, as I say, is the site of Woolwich Poly, which is of course now moved to the Royal Naval College, the old Royal Naval College as Greenwich University, and much more salubrious. They're all places that have connect, contributed to Southeast London's totally unrivaled role in building the connected world. Those networks didn't carry phone calls, I had hasten to add. They carried data. Um, data is a very modern term, but they carried data before people talked about data. Um, they arrived decades before Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, and here is the old venerable man born in Scotland, most of his career in Canada and the US. That's him showing off his phone in 1876 at the centenary of the US Declaration of Independence. By then, the world, at least the world controlled by European countries and the US, I think what used to be called the Great Powers, was interconnected by the electric telegraph. Uh, well, my friend Tom Standage, who's uh, a senior editor on The Economist, memory called in his book, The Victorian Internet. Um, Tom lives in Greenwich, by the way. I hope he's not watching tonight, but I hope he will see it. Anyway, that's his book and it's very well worth reading. The electric wires carried telegrams and they were a seed of the international networks and of what we now call the global internet. It's also sadly, a uh, tale of industrial dereliction, and I'm hoping somebody from the Royal Borough of Greenwich is listening to this, from being the centre of the high technology industry of telecoms in the 1850s for 100 years. There isn't a single research and development site or factory in the whole of London, with one small exception in Greenwich. Um, and that's North Woolwich, so excuse me, uh, Greenwich people, but it used to be part of the borough of Woolwich until 1960s, uh, but that is a typical picture from North Woolwich. But we're going to go over the next hour from an original semaphore system from the Admiralty, which speeded up communications for the first time, 
the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street, where the fundamentals of electricity were discovered, down to King's College London in the Strand, home of more fundamental research, but also commercial practical research. Uh, the first commercial use of telecoms at Euston, Paddington, and the line that's now the Docklands Light Railway, to a canal base near Old Street, now the centre of London's innovation hub, according to some. Sorry for my cynicism, but it's just me. To the launch site of Brunel's Great Eastern, uh, just on the other side of the river. And, of course, to the subsea cable factories in North Greenwich, Charlton and North Woolwich. We won't have time to cover them all today. Uh, but London was also home to the first commercial operations of telecoms. Eastern Telegraph Company, the National Telephone Company, the great General Post Office, all ancestors of today's BT, O2 and Vodafone. And if you read some of the fancy blurb from BT these days, it says it's the oldest telecoms company in the world because it traces back its ancestry to one of those telegraph companies that were born in the 1840s and 50s. Um, there are also other telecoms research and development and manufacturing sites in London, as well as the Greenwich factories I'm going to talk about now. GC at the Hearst Research Centre in Wembley. Pi TMC was in West Dulwich. And of course, the Post Office Research Centre in Dollis Hill, where Tommy Flowers, born in Poplar, designed and built the first digital computer in the world during World War II, working with the Cold Breakers at Bletchley Park. Um, and Tommy Flowers, I heard today there was an interview on the PM programme with Dame Stephanie, um, Steve Shirley, Dame Stephanie Shirley. Uh, she actually, her first job, she worked with Tommy Flowers. And suddenly, you know, I used to interview Steve Shirley back in the 80s when I was uh, news editor of computing. So the fact that I've got a direct connection, one degree connection with Tommy Flowers, I just found man boggling when I was listening to her this, this evening. Anyway. There is Enderby House. Uh, let's start here along the Greenwich Riverside. It was the head office for a company called Telegraph Construction and Maintenance, or Telcom. And it was the biggest maker of submarine telegraph cables in the world. And it connected people from 1850 onwards. And that dates back to 1850 or before. This is what it looked like 70 years ago. This is taken from their centenary book. Um, and this is the state it was in a few years ago, um, there we are. That was a picture I took. Uh, and I noticed Mary Mills used that picture a few days ago um, uh, in her book, in her latest book, which I'll talk about later. Um, when the successor to Telcom, Alcatel Submarine Networks had sold off most of the land for development, including Enderby House. The house, as you see, was virtually unprotected until a few of us, mostly connected with the Greenwich Industrial History Society, started spreading some of these pictures around. Um, and that's a picture I took literally 40 years ago, almost 40 years ago, 1981, two pictures. That's the whole complex from what was then STC with some of the loading gear, which is thankfully still there which was how they took the cable out of the factory onto the cable ship. The picture on the right is the John W. Mackay, which was moored there for many, many years. Um, and fortunately, unfortunately, I've got some slides somewhere, but I haven't been able to find them over the last few months. Uh, they're buried somewhere in the slide box. But that's the gear, that's the, the end of the boat, the, the stern of the boat where the cable came out. And you can see the scars there. And it ran through to into the sea. Um, but there we are. Uh, that was the, that was a thriving industry in only 39 years ago. I took those pictures in 1941 during a flyer strip down the river um, to look at all the developing riverside industrial archaeology. Glyas is the Greater London Industrial Archaeology Society. Um, in this talk, I'm going to take you through London's role in the invention of the electric telegraph and the expansion of the telegraph networks across the country, and then across Europe, and then the boldest step across the oceans to North America and to India and beyond. And then, um, and that's where Greenwich comes in, because all that adventurous, pioneering, innovative stuff, Riverside London, led the way and continued continue to do so until relatively recent years. And sadly, almost nothing is left 
Uh, it happened because the UK, London in particular, had the scientists and, oh, there's another picture. That is Enderby House, again, 39 years ago. There is the loading gear, the John W. Mackay had gone, uh, but there's Enderby House on the left. There's part of the Alcatel uh, factory or STC factory, it probably still was on the left, and another part on the right. And there was a, it was a huge complex, which I will show you more of later. It happened because the UK and London in particular had the scientists and the engineers and the capital investment and the excess of materials, including a substance that comes from the sap of trees in Malaysia, which I'll talk about later. And of course, London had the global, political, military and economic role that made rapid communications not only possible, but also essential. There we are. There's Enderby House. That's a recent picture, just to give you a heart that what we've been doing in the Greenwich Industrial History Society and our allies around southeast London have actually helped. Anyway, there's me. Um, that's me a long, long time ago. I'm uh, Alan Burke Gray. I was many decades ago, I did a good degree in physics and electronic engineering, but I decided I was better at writing about technology than actually doing it. And since graduating in 1973, I've been a journalist covering the business of technology, working for publications such as The Engineer and Computing. And since 2000, I've worked as an editor at the Euromoney Group in Bouverie Street, with the last publishing company in the Fleet Street area, uh, working with its telecoms publications and getting involved in its events so next week. That's about the 21st of um, October. Uh, I'll be moderating a panel for Capacity Europe, which is one of our biggest events. And that's a virtual event, just like this one is. Um, I haven't actually been inside my office since the 31st of March. Uh, but occasionally I'm invited to talk about telecoms on the radio or TV. And that was me talking about Huawei in February. Um, but I'm going to show you the effect of telecommunications, particularly on the delivery of information, not just news, but strategic, political and financial information. That's information technology, as we'd call it today. And to support my argument, let's look at two historical events in the early 19th century. Um, death of Nelson on victory. First, the Battle of Trafalgar, 21st of October 1805. It was a naval battle off the southwest coast of Spain and the Admiralty didn't get to hear about it, either the battle itself or Nelson's death until the 6th of November. That was two and a half weeks later. Of course, you know, by then they had started bringing his body home uh, in a barrel with um, brandy, I think, to preserve it. And of course, finally, he was buried. He was he was laid in state at uh, what's now the Royal Naval College. Um, he eventually went up into the city. Um, and then ne nearly 10 years later, thing, the Battle of Waterloo uh, was a bit closer, just outside Brussels on the 18th of June, 1815. First news reached the Minister of War in London on the evening of 21st of June, that's three days later. Uh, three days after France was de defeated and Napoleon had been captured. It was reported, as you'll see here, on the 22nd of June in the Morning Post. Now, of course, you can physically travel now between the centres of London and Brussels in two hours, and messages over the internet, and I checked earlier today, between the two cities take three milliseconds, that's three thousandths of a second, to go from Brussels to London. Uh, and that's just carrying the news to London in the early 1800s. Consider the time it took then to carry the news to the rest of the country. For all of human history and prehistory, the fastest way of delivering news and information was via a rider on a horse. According to research by Dan Bogart, and this is his map, an associate professor of economics at the University of California, Irvine, the travel time between London and Manchester was about 90 hours in 1700. And by 1787, it had fallen to 24 hours. Still a long time. The biggest improvements to the speed of information was the development of the turnpike roads, well-serviced roads on which horses and carriages or stagecoaches could travel fast. But the horse was still the limiting factor. Put some sea in the way and you're in trouble, as I showed with these figures about the Battle of Trafalgar and Waterloo. It was even worse at the end of the American War of Independence. Britain and the US 
signed the Treaty of Paris on the 3rd of September 1783. Congress ratified the treaty on the 14th of January 1784, which was months later. And the signed treaty didn't reach Paris until March 1784. That's six months to finish a war. Now, before the electric telegraph, there were other ways of sending information faster than the speed of a horse. The Romans used smoke and flames. This is the signal station and they, they had at Scarborough on the Yorkshire coast. There's not much left of it now. The, 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 the ditches around it are still there, but the castle itself is just uh, foundations uh, of the signal station itself. Um, but it's a good thing to see with a spectacular view of the North Sea, which is usually cold. And the English in 1588 had a similar method, a change of beacons to warn about Spanish Armada. Uh, according to the National Trust, which looks after this reproduction armada beacon, it took 12 hours to send an alert from the south coast, where the Spanish had been spotted, to York. Now, you don't know him. This is Claude Shannon. These are what today we'd call binary signals with a word length of one bit. That bit is either zero, the fire is not lit, or one, the fire is lit. That's not a lot of information, Dr Shannon. Claude Shannon, in the 1940s at Bell Labs in the US, worked out how much information can be contained in a digital signal. And this digital talk and these pictures wouldn't be here without the mathematics that Claude Shannon developed and is used today in digital media. Uh, Bell Labs, by the way, is, of course, named after Alexander Graham Bell. Uh, people working there have won eight Nobel Prizes for physics, including these three guys who invented the transistor at the labs and one for chemistry. It's now owned by the Finnish telecoms equipment company Nokia, the same company that now owns the surviving telecoms factory in Greenwich. Um, let's move on from them. The guy in the middle was a fairly revolting character, but there we are. Um, he's very racist. But let's go on to revolutionary France. Uh, I gave birth to a much richer visual system. That's Claude Schapp. Uh, more than just the Spanish raiders are coming, or the Saxons are coming from across the North Sea, but whole sentences. Schapp built a network for Napoleon, sending messages from hilltop to hilltop by line of sight using hill stations with a set of rotating arms, and you see the code there, to show successive letters and numbers. Um, and as you see, the network covered the country, raiding out from Paris. There was a British naval officer investigating after the Battle of Waterloo, found it was possible to send a message from Paris to Strasbourg in 15 minutes. Now, those cities are 400 kilometres apart, so that means the signal travelled at an average speed of 1,600 kilometres an hour. That's a lot faster than a dispatch rider on a horse. It's also, incidentally, faster than the speed of sound, which is 1,200 kilometres an hour. Warning, though, there were no time zones or coordinated clocks in the early 1800s. Paris and Strasbourg would have both used their own solar time, as did the rest of Europe. The only way to test the speed would have been to send a message out to Strasbourg and wait for an answer. Ah, what in the telecoms industry today we call the round trip time. Anyway, in the 1790s, as the war against France was building up, the UK's Admiralty built its own telegraph networks, using, including one from London to Portsmouth and one from Deal on the Kent coast. Um, the Admiralty used shutters rather than arms, which is a bit of a mistake because they were harder to read through a telescope. The shutters, just like Schapp's system, included encoded letters, but also a few words, words that were important to the Admiralty, such as French, Admiral, Dutch, Always the Admiralty is fighting previous battles. And of course, fog, and I'll come back to fog in a minute. Um, this is the Admiralty in Horse Guards Parade just off Whitehall in central London. That building is early 20th century, so it's hard to identify where the shutters were. But one poor sketch I've seen indicates that it was at the far end. That's the far left of that picture, close to the Mall, where you see that World War II bunker, which is built of really horrible concrete covered in ivy. Um, but that goes down to a shutter, uh, to a that goes down to a shelter which was built in World War II, and is probably still there. Uh, from the central station in the Admiralty, the Deal Line had ten immediate intermediate stations. The first, after the Admiralty building, was at 36 West Square, near the Elephant and Castle. 
Yeah, it's the building with a large the bay window, and the structure was on the top, on the tower on the roof. It was also the home of the Admiralty's superintendent of telegraphs, and very splendid it is. And the whole of West Square seems to have survived the Blitz and planners and all that sort of thing. And this building was up for sale for £3 million a couple of years ago. Um, next, Plough Garlic Hill in Nunhead. It's Telegraph Hill Park now, but it was called Plough Garlic Hill in ancient days. And where the te tennis court is today is what's now... Um, was where the signal station was and as you see there's a fantastic view over london you can see on a clear day which this was in september you can see right through to westminster and if i moved right a bit you could see the uh, millennia the wheel the big wheel and all that sort of thing the next in was shooters hill in woolwich still used for telecom so as you'll see from these masts this mast and then so on eastwards into Kent and on to deal on the coast. But London, as you'll know, was blighted by fogs in Dickensian times. Um, not very good for communications and networks that require good visibility. Also, it wasn't very good at night. Incidentally, um, the shutter telegraphs, telegraph line did not conduct the news about the Battle of Trafalgar. Once the news arrived by ship in Falmouth, uh, Lieutenant John the Petionier carried the news by pochets, a horse-drawn carriage, 270 miles, that's 430 kilometres and 30 hour, 38 hours, that's 11 kilometres an hour, with 19 changes of horses. He must have been exhausted. And it didn't either bring the Waterloo news from the Kent coast. The Admiralty had closed down the shutters by 1815, it wasn't a naval war, it was the army, you know, and the Admiralty and the Army were different. Anyway, this book I recommend, heartily recommend if you can get a copy. Um, that's a book I bought off uh, eight books, I think, of 20 years ago, 10 years ago. But really good about the, um, the semaphore telegraph system. Um, according to his book, uh, the Admiralty later rebuilt the network using French style semaphores in place of shutters. And that was it for a few years until our ancestors in London, and it was London, developed the electric telegraph. And their work created the telecoms revolution. But let me come back to Greenwich and give you a statistic. And I think it's an astonishing statistic. Between 1850 and 1950, so it's first century, this company behind, beside the Thames in Greenwich made not just the pioneering Atlantic telegraph cables, but 82% of all the submarine cables in the world. That number, of course, includes the production of what was Siemens Brothers just down the river in Charlton. The companies merged in 1935 in the depths of the Great Recession because there wasn't enough business for the two rival companies. But by the time they celebrated their centenary in 1950, the year before I was born, um, they were a, the powerhouse of submarine cables. And what a legacy we've lost. There's still a factory, as you see, top right on the Greenwich Peninsula site. And now it makes repeaters for today's optical fibre subsea cables. I contend that that's the oldest continuous, continuously operating technology production site in the world. Sorry, that's a long winded paragraph. But I can't think of another factory in the world that's been making a high tech product for 170 years. Um, there is its front, and you'll see, if you look at the picture at the left, that's the same facade as existed 70, 80 years ago, whenever that picture was taken. Um, uh, it, of course, then extended all the way down to the river, and you'll see somewhere Enderby House right on the river front, and you'll see that pier at the centre right, it, which is where the ship's loaded. So that is just such a historic factory. Um, most of it is dis disappeared apart from that bitch you see at the right hand side of that picture. Um, Alan, Alan, that photograph is 1946. Thank you. Thanks, Stuart. Yep, I, I got it in the 1850, the 1950 book on the centenary of Telcom. So it, I knew it was a few years before that, but I didn't know of a year precisely. And so that's Woolwich's, Woolwich and Greenwich's huge role will be coming to in the invention of in the invention of optical fibers, the medium that carries 
not only this meeting, but the internet across countries, below the sea, onto the streets, into our homes. But why, why did it all happen in London? Largely, it's a fortuitous combination of people in the Royal Institution in Albemarle Street, which you see there, and in King's College London, in the Strand, only 10 minutes walk away, five minute bus ride, and the presence of entrepreneurs here in London. The Royal Institution and King's College were the places where the fundamentals of electromagnetism were developed, the science and technology that were used in the electric telegraph and later in the electric motors and in telephones. And these were the people, Humphrey Davy, top left, Michael Faraday, top right, Charles Wheatstone, bottom right, bottom left, sorry, and William Fotheringham Cook, bottom right, all contributed to the London to London's importance as a centre for the development of telecommunications. Let's introduce them one by one. Davy was born in Penzance in Cornwall in 1778, as industrial historians will know only too well. Cornwall led the world in the use of technology, steam engines to pump out tin mines. He became a laboratory superintendent in Bristol, and by 1801, he was at the newly founded Royal Institution, which you've just seen, exper experimenting on galvanism, in other words, the power of electricity. He was a fellow of the Royal Society at 26. That's where we all think how much we've been failures in life. He was, that's just the, the, half the average age when scientists, all men in those days, were elected to the Royal Society. And that average age has stayed the same, except there were rather more women than there were then, which means a few women, but not many. But there were none in 1801. Michael Faraday, uh, born in 1791. So, 13 years after Davy, in Newington Butts near the Elephant and Castle. And I don't know where exactly. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any record of where he was born. Uh, it was well before the date of birth certificates and things like that. He started as Davy's lab, lab assistant at the Royal Institution after attending his lectures. He built a battery, a voltaic pile in 1812, and went on to discover the, and describe the fundamentals of electricity and magnetism. Charles Wheatstone. 1802 in Gloucester, so Gloucestershire, so old, uh, you know, just nine years younger than Faraday. So it was a really fast group, really closely connected in age group of people. He was then apprenticed to his uncle, a musical instrument maker, at 436 The Strand, which is now, coincidentally, the site of a three shop. Um, it's just opposite Charing Cross Station. Uh, in 1834, he became professor of experimental physics at King's College London, that's at the age of 32, just along the Strand towards the city. The following year he started developing work by German scientist Pavel Schilling, leading to the pioneering electric telegraph. And then finally Cook. William Fothergill Cook was not a scientist, but he was the son of a surgeon and served in the Indian Army, part of the British Empire's forces. Uh, conquering and occupying India, and then he became interested in telegraphy in 1836. And he went into partnership with Wheatstone, as an entrepreneur and a scientist. And um, first task, as any entrepreneur will know, uh, is identify your customer. Who needed the electric telegraph in 1837? One of his candidate, the railways. Cook and Wheatstone found customers with the London Blackwall, Blackwall Railway, which pioneered, pioneered the route that is today covered by the Docklands Light Railway from the city to the Isle of Docks, as well as the London Birmingham Railway, which you'll see here from Euston, and the Great Western Railway from Paddington. Um, when the London and Birmingham completed the last stretch of its line from Camden to Euston in 1837, it needed a signaling system because departing trains were pulled out of Euston uphill by cable to Camden by a stationary engine. Cook and Wheatstone tried out their telegraph as a way of alerting the engineer in Camden to haul away. This was uh, the GWR uh, in Paddington opened uh, from Paddington to Maidenhead in 1838 and as a high speed railway, it needed reliable signalling. The electric telegraph was ideal. The world's first commercial electric telegraph opened from Paddington to West Drayton on the 9th of April 1839, 181 years ago. And that was American Friends a full five years or more 
before Samuel Morse, who sent his famous, famous first message, What Hath God Wrought, which you'll see there, from also along the railway line, on the 24th of May, 1844, from Washington to Baltimore. But Cook and Wheatstone, Wheatstone and the GWR beat Morse by five years and six weeks. Mm, sorry, Americans. Uh, however, Morse had a huge advantage. He invented the Morse code, as we call it today, by which messages could be sent on a single wire. Cook and Wheatstone, there's his Morse key, which he used to click away, beep, beep, beep. Cook and Wheatstone needed five wires. They weren't very well insulated and didn't work very well. We'll come back to insulation shortly. And then London and Black Blackwall opened in 1848. So that was a couple of years after, a year after the GWR ran along this viaduct to what we now know as Island Gardens, but was then called North Greenwich. For a time it used cable haulage. Uh, people liked cable haulage and all sorts of weird transportation systems in the 1840s. Uh, look at what uh, Brunel did in, in uh, Devon. Uh, it was then called North Greenwich. Uh, for a time it used cable haulage and Cook and Wheatstone Telegraph, uh, you can see it in the Science Museum in London, coordinated the trains. So let's just recap. It took a few years, five at the most, between Professor Wheatstone starting work on telegraphy at King's College in the Stand and the first commercial applications. And by any standards, that's fast development. And there was more to come. In 18... Um, 46, Cook, the entrepreneur, set up the Electric Telegraph Company. This technology wasn't just for railways. It had a commercial application. It allowed companies and governments and individuals to send commercial and political and private messages. Births, marriages, deaths, things like that. That's what my grandparents always regarded the telegon arriving as signifying a death in the family. Um, and that was in the 50s and 60s. As you see here. The Electric Telegraph Company by 1852 had developed a network which reached to Exeter in the southwest, which reached to the Yorkshire coast and to central Scotland and to Anglesey, from which the telegraph, for which the boats went to Ireland. And fairly shortly afterwards, one of the first subsea cables went across to uh, Hoth near Dublin. Um, by the way, um, and some of you are under 50. So what is a telegram? It was a written message you paid by the word. It's a word I've been using constantly for the last 15 minutes, uh, last half hour. Um, you kept messages short, or if you had more to say, you combined words uh, because you paid by the word and you paid, depending on distance, a lot by the word. Uh, I'd recommend you to read this book, uh, Evelyn War. 1938, Scoop. Um, he, this talks about William Boot, who was a mistakenly sent by his newspaper, The Daily Beast. He was a country life writer to a war in East Africa. You know, his editor sent Chris messages in what we called at the time, what they called at the time, telegraphies. Uh, Boot had no idea what this was all about. Uh, he wrote back long rambling replies like that. Well, any news very wet here, yours, William Boot. Uh, war was an obnoxious racist, but if you filter that out, it's worth reading. Uh, you sent a telegram by going to the post office and handwriting your message on a form. You paid your cash over the counter. Then a telegraph operator in the back office would tap it out. It was very public on a Morse key or on a keyboard. Um, it meant the people in the post office knew what you were sending. Um, my late mother used to have a friend who worked in the post office, main post office in Google, and they could also plug into people's telephone calls and listen to what they, there was a phone box just outside. And they said, oh, I wonder what she's saying. And they went and listened in. Um, this was in the fifties, I think. Anyway, um, what did they look like? The messenger, sorry, the messenger message was routed through the network, often had to be rekeyed and sent to the nearest post office to its destination, where it was written out by hand on another form or printed out on a paper tape in block capitals um, and stuck down. And then somebody would get on a bike like this. Um, this is right by the main post office, which is not there anymore. It's now a bank. But that statue of Roland Hill is definitely there. It was there a couple of weeks ago. 
Um, and then they would ask if there was a reply and the center could choose to pay for a reply or the recipient could pay a charge for a reply. What did telegrams actually look like? There were two for my father. I'll show you in a minute. Arnold Burkett, who was stationed in the Middle East uh, in the second half of World War II. And he was demobbed from Aden. And that's just, that's in August 1945. So basically it's the end of the Second World War. He was in Aden. He stayed on another year um, because it took a long time to demob people. But it's now Yemen. He sent this telegram to his parents in Ghoul, Yorkshire, to say what ship he'd be on. He got the month wrong. Uh, he said he was sailing the 3rd of November. He actually sailed the 3rd of October in the Arund Arundel Castle, which you see up on the bottom left. Uh, no one, but no one, would use the phone for that. And there weren't even any phone lines over such distances in 1946, October 1946. So it's 14 months after the end of the war. Um, and anyway, my grandparents uh, didn't have a phone. They didn't know anyone with a phone. It says he was uh, embarking, as you see, on the 3rd of November. He got the month wrong. It was actually 3rd of October. And it took three days for the telegram to arrive, as you'll see from the stamp from the post office at the top right. My grandfather, I've got a little note, followed his progress from the daily copy of the Lloyd's Register at Shipping and the Ghoul Library. And my other grandfather also used to go down daily to look at the Lloyd's Register of Shipping because his son, Leslie, also was at sea, on deep sea. And so they follow each other. To see where they were. When he arrived in England, he sent this to say he docked in Southampton on the 15th of October. That was a Tuesday. He'd be home by Friday. So that's what a telegram looked like. That was the shortness, you know, six words on the top telegram, five words on the bottom telegram. You kept your messages short. Um, Before turning back to Greenwich and its role in the telecoms, in around development of telecoms around the world, let me point out another significant milestone in London's contribution to telecoms later in the 1880s. It's not part of the main story, but it's worth a brief diversion. We may come back to it on a uh, Finnish Industrial History Society talk later on. This man, Guglielmo Marconi, was born in the city of Bologna in Italy in 1874, and he grew up at his family's Villa Griffoni, just to the south, where he developed a fascination with electrical engineering and the recent work by Heinrich Hertz of Germany and Oliver Lodge of the UK into electromagnetic waves. That's Villa Griffoni. Incidentally, a remarkable fact. Oh, and that's me with a statue. They go for big statues in Italy, but there we are. That's, you know, I'm five foot seven. He, that's a huge statue. Um, my, uh, a remarkable fact for you, at least I found it remarkable when I saw a short newsreel film when Joan and I uh, village, visited Villa Griffoni a few years ago. Marconi spoke English with an Irish, not an Italian accent. Quite logical when you think about it. His mother was Annie Jamieson of the Whiskey family, so he learnt English from his mother. So he spoke with a perfect, slightly northwestern Irish accent. Uh, Villa Griffoni is now a museum maintained by the University of Bologna, one of the world's oldest universities. Uh, it's the place where the term alma mater was devised. Um, at the end of the 1980s, 1880s, sorry, at the end of the 1800s, 1800s, London was where Marconi came to commercialise his invention. He was half, half Irish, which in those days, before independence, sorry, Irish friends and family, meant that through his mother, he had UK ancestry. And the GPO ran the telegraph system as a monopoly across Britain and Ireland. And this is on what is today the headquarters of BT's building in the city of London, which is actually based on the site of the old central telegraph office, which was destroyed in the blitz. Marconi brought his invention to William Priest. Uh, there he is. Uh, that's Marconi, sorry, not William Priest. The chief engine, Priest was the chief engineer of the GPO in the city. Priest and the GPO welcomed Marconi. Unlike 30 years ago, 30 years before, when the same engineer told Alexander Graham Bell, there was little need for the telephone in London as we had enough messenger boys. 
that's wireless and this is a bit advanced for us at the moment so let's go back to bits of wire you have to connect things by wire uh, fine up to a point when you can string them along poles along railway lines those provided great way leaves or so cross rooftops and that's Stockholm um, this is where all the wires came into the main telephone main telephone and telegraph exchange in Stockholm um, quite a sight horrible in the wind even horrible even worse in some of the deep frost you get in Sweden in Stockholm in Feb January and February every winter I can imagine the ice bring the cables down anyway but fine back to the early telegraph companies they built their networks along roads and railways as far as they could but it's a bit of a problem when the sea in the way so water conducts electricity so if you're on a cable underwater the water short circuits the connection the answer is this this is the leaf of the gutta percha tree grown in malaysia it's related to the rubber tree but has slightly more interesting um, applications like rubber and that's some people in Malaysia uh, gathering the sap from a gutta percha tree from gutta percha trees uh, it crystallizes into a hard material Malaysians used it as a material from ancient times but John Trudeskant brought it to Europe in 1656 uh, it has a great uh, property that it softens when it's immersed in hot water and it hardens again and it's waterproof and also handily it's an electrical insulator um, in other words electricity doesn't get through it before telegraphy gutta percha was used for host pipes and for speaking tubes so you could com talk confidentially on trains you literally got a speaking tube that you could talk across a compartment without your neighbors hearing you they were called railway conversation tubes, which the gutta percha company sold. And this uh, demonstration on the right was called the medical man's midnight friend. You rang the bell, and the doctor is in that bed at the top right, and it was a speaking tube from the front door. Um, I used to have some gutta percha in one of my teeth, replacing the middle of an infected root. But this is a this is Joan with a gutta percha necklace that I bought recently off eBay. eBay. It looks very like jet, the black mineral that comes from the Whitby area, but it actually is real gutta percha, at least if you can believe eBay. And who doesn't? The gutta percha company had a showroom at 98 New Bond Street. This looks to me from that picture as if it's the original building. It was in the 1840s, 1850s. That looks as though it dates from long before then, still in place. It's now a high fashion shop, of course. And the Duke of Devonshire had a speaking tube uh, installed in Lismore Cathedral in County Waterford in Ireland, so he could hear the sermons he was hard of hearing. And come back locally, 800 boys at the Greenwich Hospital were kitted out with shoes sold with gutter percha soles. Now, the two palaces for production of gutta percha goods, I mean, importing them from Malaysia, bringing them up the river, were in Silvertown on the river and in Wharf Road alongside the Regent's Canal, which you get through what we now call Limehouse Basin, straight to Wharf Road, which is that street there. Um, according to the map you see here, this is a building on the original site. Uh, the original Wharf Road building burned down in 1853, but this looks like a rebuild on the site. It's one of only two surviving buildings in Wharf Road. Lots of apartment blocks, lots of fancy offices, but Wharf Road runs between, as you see on the right, between the two canal basins, and you'll see gutter percha works right, just to the right of mid-centre on that picture. Now, the first person to actually use gutter, oh, that is out of place. That is the three shop, 436 The Strand, where Cook and Wheatstone actually located, uh, actually based their first office for the Electric Telegraph Company. It's obviously been rebuilt. It was be rebuilt by the bank and it's been rebuilt since then, but that's where they are. It's quite ironic that it what is still a telecom shop. Anyway, the first person to actually use gutter purchase seems to have been Werner von Siemens, one of the formidable Siemens brothers. The other was Wilhelm, or William, 
later Sir William, who came to London to set up a factory for the company in Charlton. Uh, William or Wilhelm is on the right. They set up the Siemens company in Germany. It still exists. It still makes Thameslink trains. It still makes our fridge downstairs. Um, it's still a thriving company. It used to be in the telecoms industry until they merged, sold it to Nokia about 10 years ago. Uh, but they are still a very high tech company. Um, William set up the business in Britain. He was sent off to London to set up a company. And another brother, Karl Heinrich, set up a Russian operation based in St. Petersburg. Um, still there, the Charlton factory. They called it Woolwich. Uh, it's just to the west of the Arsenal. There is Siemens Brothers in the oldest buildings, date to 1963, and I've got a map. There's the map. It's dark red of the oldest buildings around Harrington, both sides of Harrington Road. Um, the Arsenal is off to that white bit on the right, because as you remember, for all maps from until the last decade or so showed the arsenal as a great splodge of white because it was highly secret, just like the post office tower. Um, the oldest, um, the development continued right until the 1950s, the green bits uh, on the south, southern end of that map. Um, divert away a bit. On the 10th of January 1849, the UK operation of Simmons Brothers worked with a southeastern railway to lay two miles of gutter percha insulated telegraph wire, wire from a ship, the Princess Clementine in the Channel, and they successfully sent messages to London from mid-channel. That's not the channel, as you'll notice. That's uh, Greenwich. That's the uh, Royal Observatory. Um, and they, this is another historic role in telegraphy. From November 1852, the Southeastern Railway carried along its tracks the first Greenwich time signals from the observatory, from the clock you see there, um, into the founders via Lewisham Station. And presumably Lewisham Station was down the hill, so it was easier to get to than Greenwich. And they'd had a historic battle with um, the Gren London Greenwich Railway because they didn't want it to go across the park. And so that's probably why they chose Lewisham. Um, and the idea, it went to Founders Court in the city, and that is a clock which was coordinated on Greenwich time on the left. In the middle is the clock last Sunday, and on the right shows a time ball, just like the one in Greenwich to this day. The time ball's not there anymore, I'm afraid. It's now a bank, um, or it's rather a private bank, which is really rather special. But it meant all the clocks in the city, across the country, and particularly the different railway companies' clocks could coordinate on Greenwich Mean Time or railway time, as everyone called it at the time. But the 1849 test project with two miles of cable into the channel led to the world's first working subsea cable in 1850 across the channel to Calais. It survived only a few hours before the installation gave way and the message became garbled and then non-existent. Second attempt was better, with cable made by initially Wilkinson and Weatherly in Wapping High Street, and then after a patent dispute in Gateshead at Newell and Company, and then on the Surrey Canal at Cooper and Company. I haven't been able to find the exact location. I've searched lots of maps of the Surrey Canal. I haven't been able to find the gutter percha works that became Cooper and Company, but no matter. By 13th of November, 1851, Dover and Calais were connected by telegraph as they have been, apart from in times of war, ever since. The gutter purchase in company's installation was vital. And within the first two years, the company supplied 1,300 nautical miles of cable. That's 2,400 kilometers. As I said, in 1853, the Wharf Road factory burnt down. In 1854, the following year, much of the operation moved to Morton Wharf in Greenwich. One of their neighbours on the west side of the peninsula was another cable maker, W.T. Handy, which later moved to North Woolwich, where there is still a Henley Road. And it's go there on, I went there on a wet day in August. On a wet day in October, it's even worse. It is really depressing. It's just completely derelict. There is Henley Road and that's it. Um, a series of merger, mergers saw the creation of Glass Elliot in Greenwich at Enderby House. 
alongside the gutta percha company in Morden Road, uh, Morden Wharf, and it rebuilt its Wharf Road factory. Uh, you say the building is still there. Um, that's Enderby House. Uh, a few years ago, that's Enderby House, probably 20 years ago. It's named after the Enderby family. There is an Enderby, there's another picture of it with some of the S Telcom, STC, Alcatel, whatever name you want to give it, factory. And that's another picture. When it had been abandoned, that bit had been abandoned, and the local vandals, and you see two of them there, were breaking the glass. A great amusement. Fortunately, this bit, which is the cable loading mechanism, is still there, protected by a good fence. Um, the Enderbys, who were they? They were mentioned in Moby Dick, and they were whalers. Uh, and there's an end to be land in Antarctica. There you see it circled. Um, whaling was only the second most repellent trade carried on in the Deptford and Greenwich Bank of the Thames, uh, sector slavery. As you might know, many of the big houses in this area were funded from the profits that local people earned from trading human beings, including the Manor House in Lee, which was once Lewisham's local history library, but is now a community run library. And John Julius Angus Stein, who built Mycenae House near the Blackheath Royal Standard and is commemorated in pubs and wharfs and all sorts of other things around the area. He also earned his money from slavery. Anyway, let's move on. This is Cyrus Field. Um, with land-based telegraph cables covering much of Europe and North America and linking Britain to the mainland of Europe via that 1851, 1852 cable, the next big project was across the Atlantic. The financier by this behind this project was Cyrus Field, an American now commemorated in this short, rather disappointing street in the new development behind uh, Enderby House. This pioneering cable was 2,500 nautical miles or 4,600 kilometres, was built by Glass Elliott in Greenwich and Newells in Birkenhead. The Greenwich cable was put aboard HMS Agamemnon, an ageing British ship, while an American ship, the USS Niagara, took the Birkenhead portion. They started in 1857, but the cable snapped. They started again in 1858. The ships started off by meeting mid-Atlantic. There were a few more breakages by, by August. The American ship had reached Trinity Bay in Newfoundland, as you see there, which is a British colony at the time. Um, it wasn't even part of Canada. And the Royal Navy ship had reached Valencia in Western Ireland, which was, sorry, Irish friends, still part of the UK. Um, and that's there, where is the telegraph field on Valencia Island? Uh, Trinity Bay was connected by a short stretch of submarine and terrestrial cable to the, uh, to the North American mainland, being in Canada and the US. And this is a map held in the Library of Congress in Washington, showing the route right down to the eastern seaboard. Then to work, Queen Victoria sent a message to President James Buchanan, the 15th president. But scientists and engineers still didn't understand the complexities of electricity nor of insulation. They ran the cable at 2000 volts because they thought that was needed to get the signal from one end to the other. In spite of this, the cable works slowly at just about three words a minute. And because of the voltage, the gutter percha insulation broke down within a month. But Cyrus Field sold off spare bits of the cable left over from the cable laying project by Tiffany's in New York with certificates and you can still pick them up on eBay. This was on sale only six weeks ago for $250 uh, plus postage of $34. Um, then followed the American Civil War when many in Britain supported the slave owning South with the notable exception of the Manchester cotton workers who went on strike rather than handle slave produced raw material. But the industry carried on in 16 years the London factories produced 14,000 nautical miles, that's 26,000 kilometres of cables that were used in the North Sea, the English Channel, the Aegean, the Mediterranean, the Gulf and the Bay of Bengal. And you will work out, I haven't got the figures, but this included the Crimean War and there was a cable laid to the Crimea so that the War Office and the Admiralty could keep in touch with what was going on in the war between Britain and Russia. Ah. And 
Florence Nightingale and all those other good people and um, so on. Anyway, meanwhile, in 1864, Glass Elliott merged with the Gutta Percha Company to create the Telegraph Construction and Maintenance Company, a name that lasted until the 1950s. It was usually abbreviated to Telcom, and Enderby House was its headquarters. Top of the agenda was a new attempt at the Atlantic Cable. Cyrus Field was back in business, but Telcom, as telegraph construction maintenance was always called needing money. And there was an imaginative way to lay four and a half thousand kilometers of newly de designed cable. This is where the network of business people, engineers, entrepreneurs came to the rescue. Just across the river from Deptford and Greenwich, as most Greenwich Industrial History Society people will know, Millwall Iron Works on the Isle of Dogs, Eisenbach Kingdom, Kingdom Brunel designed and built the Great Eastern. It was intended to carry passengers to Australia. It was launched down this slope you see on the left, and those are the chains. Um, with great difficulty in 1858, the same year as that failed Atlantic cable was built. Like the cable, the Great Eastern, Eastern which would be the largest ship built for the next 40 years, was a failure. Ah, here is Brunel on the right, most famous for the Great Western Railway, and his chief engineer on the left was Daniel Gooch. And they and Gooch formed a company to buy the Great Eastern from its near bankrupt owners in Liverpool, cost of £25,000, and I have no idea how that is in modern money, but 25000 for a ship seems good, and nobody else had any use for it. It was refitted in Sheerness to carry cable. Uh, that's not a picture of the Great Eastern, sorry. Um, that's the Great Eastern. The picture on the top left is a, a hulk, which was is taking the cable from Enderby Wharf in Greenwich. And you can see the riverfront alongside and some of the remains of, of the jetties there and the cable going across. And that went down to Sheerness to load the cable onto the Great Eastern. So the Great Eastern started its life as a cable laying ship and Stuart Ash, who's on this call, will be saying more in December about this role in laying the first cable from Britain to India in 1870. That's 150 years ago this year. And Stuart, of course, was going to talk about this in the summer, but COVID lockdown stopped that. Anyway, work started on a new attempt at the Atlantic Cable on the 23rd of July 1865 from the west of Ireland. The project la uh, lasted barely a week before the cable broke and fell to the bottom, 2,000 fathoms, that's three and a half kilometres deep. Um, that's the paying out mechanism from the stern of the Great Eastern. Great Eastern went home to start again a year later on the 13th of July 1866. This time uh, the cable Sorry, I need to go back. Can I go back? Yes, so we are. This time, uh, the a complete cable was landed in Hearts Content in Newfoundland. It's only 14 days, which isn't bad, considering you're laying a cable, a heavy cable. It's the first time you've successfully laid a cable from Europe to America. And I'll stop, so I won't say Britain. Sorry, Irish friends, I'll keep apologizing to you. Um, it was from Ireland to North America. The cable was connected, and here's the clever bit. The ship then went back to grapple up the cable that had been lost the previous year. It was spliced to a new cable, and the Great Eastern continued on its journey back to Newfoundland with a second complete connection. From no cable to two cable across the Atlantic in just a few weeks since then, and Stuart will no doubt correct me if I'm wrong, North America and Europe have been connected by the electric telegraph without a break, by telegraph, and then the phone, and now the internet in 170 years, near enough. More, 174. One thing that hasn't changed is how the cables are landed at the beach at each end. These are some pictures of cables being landed throughout the last 150 years or so. Uh, that's a very early picture in, I think, Newfoundland. Uh, that is TAT1, the first transatlantic phone cable in the 1950s. This is from about 10 years ago, and I can't remember which cable is, sorry, as an editor of a telecom, of editing at large of telecoms magazine, I get these all the time. But actually one of the last, this one on the bottom right, 
is from earlier this year when the Cook Islands on the sea of the South Pacific were connected by cable for the first time ever and they are enjoying access to the internet. They have had access via satellite, um, um, O3B, which is called the other three billion. It's run by um, SES in Luxembourg, and it's a nice little uh, constellation of satellites. With a really, they're quite low in the sky, so they're really quite fast. But and they provide. I had a conference call with somebody in the Cook Islands who was head of that project. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, it was a really good connection. But now they've got fiber all the way from the Cook Islands to Hawaii, and then it connects to the Trans-Pacific fiber connections into the US and into Asia, and they're connected into the world, and it's brilliant, and they're really loving it. Anyway, let's go back down the River Thames to Siemens Brothers. Uh, the British arm of Siemens Brothers was German-owned, but on the 4th of August 1914, World War I broke out. Um, that's their ship, that's their cable laying ship, called the Faraday, uh, which is why I guess the factory is called Faraday Works. Um, for such a huge operation, it took more than a year for the legal situation to be sorted out. Um, the company was in enemy property and it was put in British hands by January 8, uh, 1916, so that was a year and four months or so. Um, there's another story I'll di uh, divert you with. 4th of August 1914, Britain declared war on Germany about 11 o'clock at night. By the early hours of the morning, a post office had sent out its cable ships into the English Channel to grapple up the German telegraph cables, which went to northern Spain and onwards to North America via Spain and cut them. Uh, and then they stole them. They used them to connect to Britain later on. Uh, but they cut off Germany um, from North America within literally hours of the war being declared. Uh, and there's a modern story I can tell you with, if we've got a moment, and I th think we probably have. Um, we've got about 10 minutes to run. Um, what happened? Uh, somebody, I was talking to somebody earlier this year who is very well connected in the telecoms industry, uh, about the conflict or the uh, dispute between China and the US, who, and we were talking about uh, the United States blocking Chinese telecoms companies from operating the US. Companies like China Mobile, China Telecom, China Unicom, and they've lost their licenses or been refused licenses. And this person said to me, what happened right at the beginning of the First World War? What's the first British act of war? And I knew what he was talking about. And that just sent shivers down my spine. But anyway, let's move on to after the armistice in 1918, the Woolwich Siemens remained a British company. It sold its operations in Stafford in the Midlands to English Electric and Siemens Brothers reformed an association with Siemens of Germany. It bought a new cable laying ship you see on this book cover. Um, that's where the map came earlier, the plan of the factory. Times were tough and in 1935 it merged its cable business with Telcoms just up the river in Greenwich. The new company was called Tele um, Submarine Cables Limited but the Telcom name survived and I've got a book, the centenary book which still uses Telcom. And then of course in 1939 the war started again and Siemens Brothers again British owned, British controlled, uh, became, was enemy property but was reclaimed by the British government. And here's a fascinating picture taken by the Luftwaffe in German Air Force showing the Siemens Brothers factories as targets for bombing uh, even though they had been German owned and there were a lot of other things going on like that. Um, STC, we will come to later, was owned by an American company, ITT, uh, which also owned a plane making company in Germany and uh, Standard Electric Florence in Germany. And so German planes were bombing, owned by ITT in America, were bombing factories in Britain owned by ITT in America. Anyway, much later, that's um, that's a bit of the whole site around uh, Siemens Brothers. That in fact, it's quite interesting because it's right at the far eastern end of that map, which is submarine cable depot, post office, telegraphs. It says, and that's still called a cable depot. So I can imagine that 
and Skane Stewart might know better because he worked on the site. Uh, you see the telegraph works stretched out along there um, with a depot, which is presumably where they handed the cable over to the post office for laying. But the building is still there. I mean, it's an amazing bit of historical Greenwich and Woolwich or Charlton. I can give you some information about that. Uh, at the well, end of War Spite Road, that place, it was the um, depot for maintenance of the British Telecom, well, uh, the post office. Um, the post office, yeah, exactly. Post office ships yeah. were moored off there and they went out to repair cables that got damaged in the North yeah. Sea from there. And that that was there as a depot um, through to about 1970. Right, so it dated back, as you see from the date at the bottom right of that map, to well, the 1890s, probably earlier, yeah. 1881, I think, if I, I'd need to look it up. But it was uh, the post office maintenance ships. Yeah. Uh, the, the cable didn't go across to that factory. Uh, from uh, the factory, it went out on the laying ships. And when the, the, the lay was completed, uh, there was spare cable left, which was discharged back into the depot for the next 25 years of maintenance. Excellent. Thank you, Stuart. Anyway, much later... Um, uh, no, so back. Uh, much later, uh, what was Siemens Brothers became AI Associated Electrical Industries. Uh, I started out as a student apprentice at a branch of AEI in the late 60s. Um, AEI was taken over by General Electric Company, which is a UK operation, not connected, as I always used to have to say, not connected to General Electric of the US. And then GEC merged with a General English Electric which we met earlier. And then there's a huge amount of rationalization and closure and bloodletting. Um, it was a tragic era, really, late 60s, early 70s, the Woolwich factory, which had been the biggest employer in the whole area after the arsenal was shut down. At its peak, according to that book I showed you the cover of, it employed 9,583 people. I haven't been able to find out how many people worked at the telecom factory at Enderby Wharf, at its peak, but you know, it was a huge employer of high tech jobs uh, on the whole of Southeast London. It was uh, a brilliant bit of industry uh, and so sad that we've lost it. Anyway, 10 years ago, August 2010, before Alcatel Submarine Networks became part of Nokia, it won a Queen's Award for industry. Um, for the ceremony, I and a bunch of other journalists and local councillors, I don't know if you were there, Mary, um, who cover the telecoms industry, were invited to visit the factory. Um, sadly, they didn't allow photography inside the factory, but the company did bring a cable ship right up to Deptford. Not to Enderby, because there's no secure place for it to moor. That old jetty is a bit wobbly now. Um, yeah, but it, this, this was Deptford. It was more than Deptford. And this was probably the last time ever is probably the last time ever a cable ship has been moored in the Thames. It was a French ship, as you see, the Eel of the Bats. And this marked the end of 160 years of history here in London. Um, Telcom, the NDB operation has continued um, after the former Siemens Brothers factory closed down the river in Woolwich. It became part of SDC, uh, Standard Telephones and Cables, which was owned by a UK business, a US business, ITT. And if you're of my generation, you'll remember ITT is the company that worked in 1973 with the CIA to help depose Salvador Allende, the democratic elected president of Chile, and install a military government under the dictator General Pinochet, who's a friend of Margaret Thatcher, who threw his rivals out of helicopters. But though its top management was corrupt, SDC in the UK was a hugely innovative company. And this is where I come to the last great contribution to telecoms from southeast London. So far, at least, who knows what will happen in the future. Enter Charles Cow, born in Shanghai in 1933. He moved to British rule of Hong Kong in 1948, uh, did a lot of his studies there. Then he came to Woolwich Polytechnic to take his A-levels and study for a degree in electrical engineering. Um, he's traveled by boat from Southampton. There he is on the boat with other Hong Kong students coming to study in Britain. It still happens. I remember flying back from Hong Kong after a conference a couple of years ago 
because it was just before the start of term, the plane was absolutely full of Hong Kong students heading to British universities. Um, and that's Charles Cow on the right of that picture on the SS Canton on the way to Woolwich. And then he lived at 14 Rottersley Road in Plumstead, having got the 53 bus from central London, where he was billeted for a day or two on arrival. He travelled every day on the same bus route into Woolwich Poly, and Woolwich Poly was then in those buildings now sadly run down in the middle of Woolwich, looking very sad when I looked at them a few weeks ago. Now, of course, Woolwich Poly is the University of Greenwich, housed in the rather more splendid surroundings. Um, after graduating, uh, Charles Cow joined SDC. He did a PhD at UCL as an external student. And as well as its subsea cable factory at Enderby Wharf, SDC also had a factory in North Woolwich, just through the foot tunnel from Woolwich Poly. It's no longer there, of course, but there is the standard trading estate on the site. I don't know what's in there. There's a few posters up. There's an MOT test site, I see. But it's, again, it was a rainy day in August and I was feeling fed up of what decline of industry in East London, all of London. Anyway, meanwhile, on happy notes, Charles Cow had married Gwen, a British-born engineer who worked for SDC as well. By then they were living in Blackheath and they were married in 1959 at St John's Church in Blackheath. They'd previously been turned away from an ang other Anglican church in Blackheath. I assume, but I don't know, it's all saints on the heath. When the vicar told them he didn't marry foreigners. Such were the days. Um, this was Charles Cow in Harlow and his book, his memoir, which is very well worth reading. He moved out of London to Harlow to join Standard Telecommunication Laboratories, which was STC's R&D centre and one of the world's leading telecoms labs. And we had a lot in the London area then, as I've said earlier. There his boss was Alec Reeves, the pioneer of turning telephone audio into digital signals. Reeves invented pulse code modulation, which was one of the big first big advance, advances in digital communications. At STL, Cow and his colleague George Hockham invented optical fibers, the technique of carrying digital signals as beams of laser light down thin strands of glass. How? For some reason, not Hockham, and I don't know why, got the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2009, and he was knighted the following year. Sadly, he didn't deliver his Nobel speech as he was already had advanced Alzheimer's. Gwen, his wife, spoke for him. He George died. Hockham, Alan, George Hockham was dead by then. Was he? Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, um, the, all the records are sort of slightly out of date. But anyway, yeah, Gwen, his wife, read his Nobel address and he died in 2018 in California, where he'd moved with Gwen to be close to their children. Meanwhile, what's happened to Enderby Wharf? As I said earlier, there's still a factory on the site. It made <coughs> optical fibre repeaters, which amplify the light signals on long haul subsea routes. Telcom, as I said, had become SCC, and then it was bought by Alcatel, a French company. It became Alcatel Lucent. And then a few years ago, it got bought by Nokia, and it's still owned by Nokia. Nokia has tried unsuccessfully to sell the sub submarine cable business, which is back to being called Alcatel Submarine Networks. Um, but the cable manufacturers moved first to Southampton and then to Calais. And the company sold most of the space to property developers, especially the part closest to the river, which is what there is now, what is there now. Enderby House is still there, listed grade two. A group of us were very concerned a few years ago about its state, and the picture I showed you earlier of it just almost no hoardings. A few years ago, it had no security, no hoardings, and it would have been an easy, easy for an arsonist, say, to break into a weekend in during a weekend and set fire to the place. That's not unheard of with development sites, but I'm making no aspersions about the developer. Anyway, that's Enderby House now. They built an extension on the back to turn it into a pub. We created a stink in Greenwich Industrial History Society with other interested people like Mary, um, who's our co-chair and Stuart and others. Um, and the developers saved the building. And this was what it was like in September 2010, 2020, just last month. It was eventually destined to be a pub, though the pandemic has delayed any opening. 
Uh, before the development started, we talked to the developers to suggest that they should pay tribute to the site's history with some street names and building names. I'm not sure that we've been entirely successful, but we now that's that's the development site with some of those horrible flats where the factories were in, in the old days. We now have Cable Walk and we have Telegraph Avenue and we have Morse Lodge. I'm not sure if Morse Lodge is connected to Morse of Morse Code. And there's even a Samuel, Samuel Enderby fractured. <laughs> there were three Sam, Samuel Enderbys. The first died in 1797, the third in 1829, well before electric telegraph, electric telegraphy. But there was a ship, a real ship called Samuel Enderby. That's in, mentioned in Mo Moby Dick. Samuel Enderby was also the grandfather of General Gordon, as of General Gordon Square in Woolwich. And the story has it that he spent his last night in Britain before going off to Sudan to fight against people who were trying to win independence. Um, sorry, my politics are coming out here, but there we are. Um, uh, he spent his last night in Britain in Enderby House. Um, what became of STL in Harlow, you might ask? Well, Harlow is happy to acknowledge its role in optical fibres in this welcome sign on the town's boundary. That's my daughter Mary, by the way. She and her then fiance, now husband, cycled there from their home in Wimbledon when they were planning their wedding reception at the Gibbard Garden in Harlow in May 2019. Um, STL, the home of digital communications and optical fibres, was raised to the ground after a Canadian company, Nortel, bought it and then went bust. It's now a trading extent, but at least, at least there's a data centre there. And for all I know, this very presentation is coming to you via the computers held in that data centre. It's called Cow Data, but the locals in Harlow have no idea who Sir Charles Cow was. They call it KO Data, and there's no mention of Cow Charles Cow on the website either, which is sad. And that's it. So if you would like to ask questions, I will stop sharing the screen. And if you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand or ask, call away. Has anybody got some questions to ask or not? Or shall I just go on with promoting the next two presentations that we have in this, uh, in this series? Can, sorry, can I just ask yes, about the plans? My Roland Silcox, I used to work Hello, at Roland, yes. Factory in Woolwich, and also at the Telcom Factory down the bottom of Christchurch Way. There, um, it's not called quite well. Christchurch Way is now a block of flats, so it's yeah. the Telcom Road, Telcom Avenue, or Telcom Way, or something. Yeah. Okay. And, and anyway, I was just going to ask about the the buildings, the, the first original buildings in on, on the north side of Bow Water Road. Is, is there a preservation order on those buildings? Is is there is there something going to put them into a pristine? <laughs> <laughs> I, I will have Stuart because Stuart has been very active in trying to preserve these buildings. Stuart, are you still there? Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Um, we're talking about the Faraday Works, which is only a five-acre site of the what was 28 acres uh, of the uh, Siemens factory. So uh, that en encompasses the buildings on either side of Bowater Road. All right. Um, I think memory serves there are seven buildings on the site which come part of the development and um, you and I's original application was to knock down one of those you and I is the development company I yeah think. yes uh, to knock down um, 37 Bowwater Road uh, that was built in 1910-1911 um, and it's the one that goes north to south uh, at a slight angle uh, in the L shape, if you uh -huh. remember that part of the, uh, the building. Um, but that, um, for some reason, um, Historic England put a, uh, a, a preservation on, order on it, and it's now, uh, I think, a, a grade two listed building. And it was the one building that they were going to knock down. They were going to keep the other six and are keeping the other six. And the reason for knocking that one down was A, the angle that it was at, and B, because it was the oldest one on the site, they had problems with the foundations. So to get the maximum new housing units, they wanted to um, 
knock that one down and replace it with something that looked very similar, but at, at a right angle to the, the building that they were retaining uh, and put a lot of units in it. Um, the situation at the moment is... Is, is that at the Hardens Manorway end? Uh, yeah, that's right. It's a, yep, to, right. To, to the west end, end of yes. the site, yeah. Yep. The situation at the moment is um, you and I have gone back and looked at this and have reluctantly accepted that they have to um, deal with the preservation on, order on the building and they are going to resubmit a redevelopment uh, maintaining all the buildings that they now own. So all the old buildings that are on their site will be converted and uh, refurbished. Mm -hmm. uh, so the details of that development is, is yet to be seen, but obviously it will change from the current application that's available publicly uh, because with the ceiling heights of the um, 37 Bowwater Road, there's no way that they can get the same number of housing units in that block so we all wait with bated breath to see what they're going to do. But I, I think I have to say that you and I, I have worked with them on several projects now, and they go out of their way to make sure the historic um, part of uh, redevelopment is remembered and commemorated within their developments. So I think you'd be pleased to do with what, what, what gets retained. Good. Thank you, Stuart. Good news, Stuart. Yeah. Um, I have one other question, Alan, if I may. Go on, yes, go on. The, um, the cable ship, the John Mackay, that was moored up at, you know, at the bottom of the Telcom Works there, uh, it was alongside of an office suite that I worked in for many years. I remember the office suite. I used to walk past it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was the low building that, that yeah. was literally adjacent to the, to the, the wharf. Um, it, when was the Mackay removed? I assume it's gone. It's gone and broken up. They took it. It, it was full of concrete at the time. Yeah, they took it up to the north. We normally get quite a bit of detail on her if, if Mary I'll, gone. Here's a dress. Do, do, you want me, do you want me to answer that? Go on, whoever. Yeah, Stuart. Yeah. Um, which building did you. Was that the accounts block that you worked in? Uh, no, I was in a, a purchasing unit right adjacent to the. Um, just behind Enderby House, you think, in fact, alongside the tent. I looked out the window and there was the John Mackay. Yeah, so sorry. When, when did the Mackay disappear? I, I remember sorry, it I'm being just, there and then it wasn't there. Sorry, I, I was working on the site at the time it went, so I'm just trying to establish where, where uh, Ron actually, uh, Ronald actually was. Um, when you come up, when you come up at the road, uh, the ramp from the, the main floor, uh, on your right would be the uh, Enderby House and north uh, the northwest block. Was you, um, you were in the building to the left, were you? Um, just if you're facing the Thames, I was to the right of that. Oh, in the northwest block. Yeah, it, it, it was a low unit. Oh yes, on the front of the north side, it, block. right on the front of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know that because uh, I w I was in the block to the other side of the ramp because I was in the projects department. All right, I was in hydrospace. Ah, uh, yeah, well, see, we never talked to one another, did we? <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the John Mackay came back um, from her last lay, which was out in um, Australia. She laid a cable from um, Queensland up to Papua New Guinea mm -hmm. uh, in, in 1976. And when she got back from that, she was moored up onto the dolphins. And she remained there until... 1982 when she was towed away and if you remember the um, general manager of the site was at that time John Cottrell yes well John Cottrell um, was asked to set up a trust to try and get um, the ship saved and used as a museum and they were going to have it in the West uh, West Union docks but they couldn't raise the capital. And when John, when John Cottrell retired, Brian Knight took over uh, to try and do it. But eventually, um, sh you'll find that if you look around, and I can't remember the names of them, there are a couple of films where she was used as a ship. As um, So there are a couple of films that you'll see, uh, you might look at, I'll, I'll 
I can dig out the names for you, but you you can look at them and, and you'll go, oh, crikey, that's the John W. Mackay, and she's still yeah. moored at Greenwich. But eventually, uh, there wasn't enough money to maintain her, and she was towed, towed away and scrapped. Mm. Sad. That, that was in the early, uh, the mid 80s that she. she, she, she yeah. I, I, I was there. I was there until. I'm just trying to find the history because this is one. Oh, that's Hague's book, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, brilliant book. I've got a copy of that. Yeah. Which one have you got? Version uh, two or one? Oh Only my one God. Of don't ask. <laughs> Long time ago. Well, volume two has um, was produced in 1975 and issued in 1960. Um, and I was a young engineer working for projects then. Really? And he, he came in and he was given access to all the old tel uh, telcon documents. Uh -huh. And one of my tasks was to be his gopher for, uh, for about 18 months. Okay. And he gave me a signed copy of his new book. Oh, brilliant. Which is one of my treasured possessions. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Um, I'm trying to find the reference to the ship, but I can't. Uh, but I have seen it before. But it's not a very good index. But, John, yeah. John W. Mackay, I, yeah. I can tell you what page that's on. Give me a minute. Mary, go on. I think she floundered, didn't she? There's quite a bit of detail about that on some green sites. But, Alan, can we just quickly go back to Enderby House? Yeah. Because we really still don't really know what's happening. The pub's never opened. And at the moment, pubs are closing left, right and centre. And I don't think we know what Young's intend to do. Well, I don't think Young's knows what Young's intends to do as well, to be frank, Mary. I mean, I think we're, no, we're, but... you know, we don't know whether next week every pub in England is going to have to close. So... Um, nobody's um, going to be hiring a staff and fitting out a kitchen and training chefs. We need to flag pop. up. That, huh? And the other thing, of course, is the sculpture, which um, ley lines, which Stuart had a lot to do with, which is down by the... Um, on, on the on the foreshore. Was, ...was commissioned. Uh, by, uh, and it um, represents shafts of cave, but Stuart knows more about it than I do. But it was put in as part of the development. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, well, that's that's still there, and I, I, I saw it only a week or so ago, um, and it's still there, but needs a bit of uh, maintenance and loving care, I think. But There is a problem with that, which we're trying to address. What's the problem? <laughs> the management on site didn't hear me say that. Go, sorry, go on. No, no, they're switching the... No, no, you don't get interested in this, Alan. It's <laughs> The politics of what's going down on the estate. Hopefully, uh, things will improve. So, hello, uh, Alan. It's Phil Toad up here. Thanks for inviting. Uh, hello there, Phil. Yeah. Being north of Watford, every time you said Greenwich, I thought you said Greenwich. So I did. Twitch Sorry. It. Yes. But um, John, John, fascinating. Phil's an old friend who used to work for AT and T, by the way. So he's. But, but uh, what I was to say was that um, you should probably have a chat with Niall, Niall Hickey, because yeah. Because AT and T and Alcatel heritage. He might uh, and uh, fervent Charlton athletic supporter. He might have some. Uh, oh goodness, of course, yes, yes. Around uh, to some of all this uh, stuff, and he might uh, be able to exploit some of his contacts to uh, get some of the history and uh, perhaps supply you with more pictures and uh, anecdotes from the uh, mad world of telecoms. And if you're going to continue uh, with your delve through the history, then uh, you, I, I can contribute from uh, probably about 1985 onwards. Um, <laughs> the mad things that went on uh, in my neck of the woods. So anyway, thanks for inviting me to the call. It's been fascinating. Great. Um, thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, thanks, Bill. I can go back and answer Ronald's question now. Yeah. Um, page 270, the John W. Mackay. Right. Of... Uh, the second issue, if that's what you've got. Well, I've got the first issue, so I've got it on page uh, 260. There you go. There it is. If you can see that. Yeah. Well, for both of the books, uh, she was would have been an active cable ship at that time. She didn't yeah. retire until uh, 1976. Yeah. And she was owned by, owned by the commercial owned by the commercial cable company, which yeah. was part of IT and T by then. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but then when 
STC moved over to Greenwich in 1970. Uh, they took over the commercial cable company. So that that was part of the deal. So right. when they bought out SCL and became STC Submarine Systems, uh, the commercial cable company became part of the, uh, came under the, under its umbrella. Great. Okay. Well, it's nine o'clock. I think it's probably time to wind up. So with everybody's agreement, I will just do um, go back to sharing screen so I can see that show you the last. There we go. Um, Did um, I Otis chair to thank you and things like that? Sorry, hold on a minute. Let me just say, uh, oh, hold on. Uh, oh. Zoom sounds over. That's right. Hold on. Right. Questions. We've done questions. There's a nice map. So let me just say we've got two more virtual uh, presentations coming up for the Greenwich Industrial History Society before Christmas. Mary, who you've just been hearing from uh, on 10th of November 2020, at the same time, 7.30, we'll be talking about the Greenwich Peninsula. And that's her recently, recently published book, which I got on Saturday. Thank you, Mary. Um, a wonderful picture there of the dome and uh, sadly lost that gas. was taken oh. from the NDB sales office. Oh, of course it was. Yes, I see that. Yes, and there's the NDB house in the middle. Yeah. And there's the, uh, the, the gear uh, on the foreshore. Yeah. And then Stuart, whom you've also been hearing from, will be talking on the 8th of December. Stuart Ash on, on the Eastern Telegraph Company's really long cable system the red sea line it was called because it went through the red sea i assume all the way to india and it went from the uk to india and that's 150 years old this year 1870 the anniversary was um, and people at porth kernow were celebrating it the porth kernow is where lots of cables used to land still probably do and there's a museum there so it's had a tough time this year so Stuart will be talking about the Red Sea Line to India and fleshing out a lot more about this part of London's history in telecoms. Uh, and that's his book on John Pender, which I heartily recommend. John Pender was one of the senior businessmen in this whole industry around, around this part of London. So coming for that, we're going to we're recording this uh, presentation and we're report, recording Mary's and Stuart's presentation. Where they'll be, I don't know, uh, but you can see our uh, Facebook group, which Mary maintains. Um, search for Greenwich Industrial History um, on, on first Facebook and you'll find it and you can join it. We have 656 members, which is just an astonishing number. Um, and we also have a blog. Um, so go there or just search for Greenwich Industrial History. Um, and I think that's probably anybody. Mary, do you want to say anything finally as co-chair of Greenwich Industrial History Society? Well, I want to thank you for giving this inaugural talk and to for running the Zoom system as well. Um, that's all right. <laughs> I've been living my life on Zoom for the last six months, Mary, and on Microsoft Teams, but Zoom is well, better. It's a, a great thing. I was only going to also say... Um, I mean, if people have got any comments or anything, if they get in touch with us through the Facebook page, perhaps is yep. easy. And um, we can process them. And we can also, you know, get questions and queries answered and all sorts of stuff. Just get in touch. Exactly. And as I say, um, I will be getting a, a, a recording from Zoom in a few minutes of the whole hour and a half, which is a bit mind-bogglingly long. So we're going to have to work out what's the best way of putting it up on the website, on the Facebook group. So you can watch it. And I need to trim off that first 15 minutes of just, just waffling. Uh, but I've got plenty of elements up there and I need to learn how to work it. So, so much technology. Okay, everybody. I'm probably going to stop at this point uh, and say good night to everybody. And- uh, Look at the chat. There's some people getting in on the chat bit before you switch it off. Uh, on the chat, we're- uh, There's people chat. saying thank you and- Talking about what their experiences. Yeah, thank, yeah there's uh, Roberta Arden says, great talk, very interesting. Thank you, Roberta. Kim Bowden says, first time joining you. Well, it's the first time we've been virtual, so thank you very much. 
we hope at some point to be in the flesh in Blackheath. Uh, Maria Roberts says thanks for an enjoyable and informative oh, talk. So and Indra Neil says, thank you very much, Alan. Great and informative talk. I could not help but mention that I used to live on Cyrus Field Street till August. Hey, hey. Mm -hmm. and currently I work at Teledyne E2V, which used to be Marconi Company, which was originally founded by Marconi back in 1900s. And I was a student apprentice, as I said earlier, at AEI in Leicester were in the late 60s and that became Marconi as well. So we all have Marconi. Everyone has worked for Marconi at some point in their career. Even I think um, quite a few of you on this call. Yes, okay. Phil, I think worked for Marconi at one stage, did you not? Maybe not. Okay, I'm gonna stop, stop waffling. Good night, everybody. Thank no. you very much for a fascinating hour and a half. Bye-bye. Good night, Alan. Thank, Thank you. Good night.